Awesome. Well, as you know, uh, as as I mentioned with these webcasts, um, everything is posted up to on our YouTube page within the the next twenty four hours. Which I I can't recall you know, before we make your introduction if that's even how we met or how this partnership started. But I feel like it's been a couple years of us going back and forth on different projects now. Yeah, I was my pet. Did we meet because of my podcast or? I think we spoke before your podcast. Yeah, I think so too. But I can't remember in what context. Or maybe we sent you I, some, some swag for a video or something. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have um, a ton of White Lab swag that I need to break out. I've got like those tube socks. I'm actually wearing my White Lab shirt right now. <laughs> it's like wearing a, wearing a band shirt to a <laughs> concert. <laughs> It's all right. Who actually works for White Loves? Nobody knows. I didn't even wear a White Love shirt today. So. <laughs> uh, but I've got a nice picture of our fermenters behind me. So it's better than yeah. a blank wall of an office. Um, but I'm stoked to be able to, to chat with you today. Um, you know, I think we've, we've both worked and had a lot of similar experiences on the homebrew scale when it comes to fermentation. Um, but I yeah. think your, you know, your background and how, how avid of a brewer you are and, and how uh, in tune you are with different processes and different pieces of equipment. I mean, it seems like every other video that you're doing isn't just a, a pale ale video. It's more about here's a new piece of equipment that, that you're learning how to do with the viewers, which is pretty great. Yeah, there's, well, uh, this is probably work to my detriment that uh, I don't test equipment before I record myself using it. <laughs> So it's truly just like kind of learning as you're watching me, which, uh, you know, sometimes it turns out well, but I also think that I get so much advice in the comment sections because of it and just like, you shouldn't do that. And honestly, I've learned so much from people just like being like, Hey, maybe try it this way. And it's just like things I would have never thought about. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, though. I think, you know, I enjoy your content because of that approach. Um, you know, we were able to produce a decent amount of videos last year when things were a little bit slower. And, you know, I had myself and our, our videographer come out to my house for a homebrew day. And we got so caught up in filming that, like, all the gravities were completely off and we didn't hit our numbers. And, you know, but we, we had a beer and we had content. So I was like, how do we tweak this into something that's still teachable um so yeah. we're able to take the, the beer into our lab and actually kind of talk about what happened and, and what the the values actually were instead of just our calculated values that didn't align so it was it was pretty fun but you know from that behind the scenes standpoint is interesting and um, trying to learn how to adapt in that regard because it's it's not just making a video or brewing a beer it's hard to do both at the same time it's a lot of work. And uh, I actually just had the chance to not record myself while I was brewing a beer. Oh my gosh, so much easier. <laughs> Holy crap. It's just like so much less to think about. I was like doing laundry, doing the dishes, like also mm -hmm. like got a beer boiling. I'm like, I got so much done in one day because I basically brewed the same recipe twice. So I made 20 gallons and then I actually fermented 10 gallons with a harvested yeast from a Le Fin du Mon. And um, then I did a five gallon batch with Belgian Ardennes yeast and a five gallon batch with the Abbey yeast. So yeah, that's awesome. A lot of Belgian coming. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know you've been to um, Kitchen and Tap in Asheville, our production facility mm -hmm. up there in our pub. Um, but, you know, same here down in San Diego where, where I'm at. Uh, we do a lot of the split batching like that and it's it's such a, a homebrew inspired approach and a, a way to to save time and ingredients um, but still get very starkly different beers right and I uh, I've been to your location actually as well um, okay and I mean I got the whole behind the scenes tour and it's awesome I loved it um, but uh, you guys really inspired me to do these split batches because like when you are brewing a 10 gallon, it's so easy to just like, you know, have two five ish gallon fermenters throw one kind of yeast in one, one kind of yeast in the other, and just like try it out. There's, oh, well, yeah, that's like what I really love to do more than anything. I think it's like try different hops, 
try different yeasts, compare the two, see what's different, see what's the same, see what you like better. Yeah. And what, you know, what I see, not only from like our personal preferences, but like our, our customers too, is sometimes you end up with one strain that people prefer a lot more over the other, right? And it might mm-hmm. just be the, the fermentation profile. It could have been the, the specific base beer. Like it might not just be the yeast strain. It could be a lot of other factors, but um, there definitely can be a preference even when it's minute. And so when we're split batching on the commercial, side we're trying to create sellable beer that, that educates it's mm-hmm. we try to balance uh creativity with preferences too right so it might be when we first opened um about 10 years ago on, on the, our brewing co opened i should say um we were getting pretty crazy with it we'd have cow ale and a pale ale next to wlp 300 half of and ale yeast and you know it was, it was really Very cool <laughs> to yeah try it side by side but when it came to you know, everybody would order a flight and then you order a pint. And then next thing you know, you've, you've kicked all the kegs of the California yeast. And then you have three barrels left of the the half and nobody really wants that on its own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in that spot right now. Like, uh, I, we're going to talk about fermentation temperature and, uh, yeast. And I definitely like screwed up my new England IPA as I do every single New England IPA I ever make I can't make a good one like at least my taste I'm so picky about him uh my husband thinks it's fine but it's like it's and my uh my fermenter wasn't uh sealed all the way for the first three days sitting at 75 degrees so you have that character uh Mm -hmm. the like homebrew (laughs) character yeah and yeah now I'm sitting on like seven gallons of it just like hanging out and I'm like what am I supposed to do with this I think I'm gonna throw in some grapefruit juice and just cover it up (laughs) yeah um yeah I mean let's before we jump into you know some of the the pros and cons or mishaps with fermentation uh why don't you tell everybody who you are who floor of brewing is and uh, what what gets you up out of bed in the morning to keep (laughs) brewing more beer um i'm sarah flora uh most people know me from instagram uh flora brewing and youtube flora brewing um i basically record myself brewing beer and making mistakes and learning with you guys so uh yeah i don't plan very much on my youtube (laughs) honestly um but uh yeah i'm just you know, kind of doing experiments um, in my garage brewery. I'm in Los Angeles, so um, temperature affects me a lot more than most, I think, who might live in the northern climes. Um, So yeah, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's like, I keep telling people fermentation temperature is the hill I will die on. (laughs) It's like, that's what I'm going to yell at you about if you stop me and ask me about homebrew. (laughs) So what, uh, I mean, what, what got you started doing what you're doing? Uh, did you just start an Instagram account to have fun and showcase that? Like what drives you to keep, keep doing that and sharing your experiences with, with so many fans and homebrewers? Um, you know, it just kind of started. I was an artist, um, for a long time. I still work in the art world. That's my day job. And, um, I had like an Instagram for my paintings and I just started throwing up beer stuff and it, the beer stuff took off. And then eventually I deleted all the art stuff (laughs) and I changed the name. So, um, yeah, it just kind of exploded. And then, um, about a year and a half ago, uh, like right before like COVID shutdown happened, I started my YouTube channel. Um, and I started the YouTube basically because uh, there's only so much I feel like you can learn on Instagram, especially like back when I started my Instagram, it wasn't like IGTV or whatnot. So YouTube's always been like the place people go to, to learn things. And um, not only am are people going to my YouTube to learn things, I am literally making the YouTube videos so I can learn things. And, um, you know, it's like one of those things I always say that the best way to learn something is to teach it. So I feel like just because I kind of try to keep myself on at least a weekly schedule with YouTube, I, my brewing know-how has increased dramatically just 
by way of, you know, keeping doing it. Um, it's like the 10,000 hour master thing. <laughs> you just kind of got to force yourself to work on it constantly. And then you get there, I guess. <laughs> yeah. How much, uh, you know, as, as we were talking about earlier, like you, you get the opportunity to, to brew with a lot of variety of equipment and to test out different processes, right? It's not, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot of content out there that's just focusing on different styles, which you do from time to time. But, you know, for the most part, I'm always intrigued in what you're posting because it's, you know, um, fermenting under pressure or, you know, an all-in-one brewing system, that kind of stuff. Um, how, how is that affected a learning curve when you're changing your process so much right how do you refine your skill when you're always changing when you have so many variables changing um well it's like i'm always just kind of like that like even in my cooking style i my husband's always like you never write anything down how can you re recreate this like i do write my recipes and things down i do post them and whatnot and i do recreate same recipes but they're never identical um you know, it's, I just kind of like get interested in something and then I like run with it until I find the next thing. And um, like pressurized fermentation, I'm obsessed with right now. Um, I think a lot of people are getting into it because um, the equipment has become a lot more um, reasonably priced. You can get like the plastic fermented, mm -hmm. pressurized fermenters for like a hundred bucks or so. And um yeah, I mean, it's just like, I kind of switch equipment and try new things out because I am trying to solve the problem. And for a long time, that problem was the temperature issue. So I have like the glycol chiller. I have a fermenter with a Peltier cooling technology. I have, what else do I have? The pressurized fermenters I've got, I've fermented in my kegerator before. I used to keep a room at 65 degrees <laughs> in my apartment. <laughs> it's like, I, it, you know, I've always, I'm trying to make good beer. And I think I finally have figured out how to make good beer, except for the New England IPA. <laughs> and, um, so it's just like the learning process of like, seeing this problem and then trying everything in my power to fix it. And like, even just figuring out how to identify what the problem is, I think pushed me towards new equipment um, a lot. I'm also just a gearhead. I love new toys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What, uh, I mean, you have a lot to choose from. Like what is, if you were, you know, you said you brewed a beer the other week just for yourself. Right. And you didn't, you didn't throw the camera on in front of you. What, what was your fermentation look like that? What, what types of equipment, what type of fermentation control did you use? Um, well, right now I, I just got a new um, claw hammer supply, 240 volt, 20 gallon kettle all in one system. Yeah, that's um, rad. Yeah, th those guys are pretty rad too. It's so fast. I actually just brewed with them. If you guys want to see a hilarious homebrew video, go check out their YouTube. They just posted it on like Sunday. And yeah, I their, their stuff is just like, there's so much personality, right? <laughs> oh yeah. They're so fun. Yeah, I'm so happy I got time. to go visit them. It's yeah. a, it was amazing. Um, so they sent me one of those systems and it's so fast. It's mind blowing. Um, I like brew before I go to work now. Um, and I start, I start work at noon. So it's like not as crazy as it sounds, but, <laughs> um, so I did that. And then I have this, uh, 14 gallon brew built, uh, fermenter. That's the one with the Peltier, uh, like heat exchanger in it. So, um, it just sits at whatever you want it to, and it's got heating and cooling in it. So that's my new go-to, especially if I'm doing large batches. Um, so actually, so I brewed 20 gallons of Belgian triple and I did three different yeasts. So I did the brew built fermenter for 10 gallons of it and um seemed to work fine did it under pressure 15 psi and then i took two and one of them i put in well i did two keg king pressurized fermenters but i have like one of the smaller like i think it's 25 liters and then one of the bigger that's like nine gallons or something um so those, I just, I didn't really temperature control. I threw them in my laundry room, which stays about 75. My AC did go out this weekend. So 
probably got up to like 90. We'll see what happens. It's a Belgian, it can use little phenols and it's under pressure. So it's gonna be cleaner anyway. Um, but yeah, I just, I got another spunding valve because I'm so into pressurized fermentation now. So I have like one of the ones that close with a screw and one of the ones that are like a poppet in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have what, advice actually for spunding valve people because I keep running into issues with it. But mm -hmm. I found that if you have the poppet kind, if you put some keg lube in there, works a hundred times better. Mm. I don't. I, it was just a whim, and I did it, and it works. Yeah, I feel like that <laughs> fixes a lot of problems. Oh yeah, keg lube uh, fixes everything. Yeah. What uh, you know, what are you looking for while fermenting under pressure? Right. Usually, what we've seen is um people brewing loggers that want to utilize a warmer temperature for speed or, you know, like in lack of the ability to control those temperatures from ending under pressure to mute ester production. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Belgians are very ester forward beers, right? Those are super expressive. Like, what are you looking to get out of that? Um, they are very ester forward and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's an experiment. Um, but I, I love clean beers. Like I'm total lager person. Um, like there's a British brewery down the street. My favorite beer at the current moment is their um, ESB. It's so clean, so malty. It's just perfect. What and is that? It's called a McLeod mm -hmm. in Van Nuys. It's yeah. great if you're ever in the Valley, you got to step by. Their pizza is also amazing. Um, so yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, I definitely don't think that I've seen too much of a decrease in like esters because of fermenting under pressure, but I, usually when I'm fermenting under pressure, I'm fermenting pretty warm. So compared like for a Belgian, that's like not a crazy temperature. Um, so I don't know what's, we'll see. I, I don't like a Belgian that is too estery either. Um, mm -hmm you know, it's like, I, I don't like like a Hefeweizen like nose either. Um, but that's just personal preference. Personally, I would like a beer to almost smell like nothing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm super into lagers. I haven't drank an IPA in so long. Uh, and I, I tried one the other night and I was just like, oh my God, this is going to give me a headache. And it's just like so bitter. So I'm sessionable, old man. <laughs> low ABV lagers for the most part. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. we had uh, we just we had a beer station at uh, the Craft Brewers Conference last week, and uh, we had a bunch of different beers throughout the week, and we had an American light lager, and that was the one that we kept putting on each day. Like, what beers do you want to put on? It's like, well, it's what we're drinking. It's what everybody's <laughs> wants to drink, and it's just it's so funny, like how not full circle, but, you know, so much craft beer for, for decades has pushed away from what's, what's a PC way of saying it, you know, um, <laughs> balanced. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say Agreed. bland, but that doesn't sound, but you, you know what I mean? Is that it was like, you know, we don't, we don't want those bland beers in craft. And, uh, one of my first eye-opening beers, and I'd be curious to hear yours too, was, you know, stone brewing IPA. And it was just like, it was, gross when I first had it but I liked that it was gross like it was like floral and bitter and resiny and piney and lingered right and I was like wow this is unlike mm -hmm. anything I've had before and I, and I still enjoy that you know now but I also really enjoy a, a light lager that I don't have to think about that that is fairly balanced that's light that's effervescent and you know goes with yeah. anything yeah Agreed. And I like, since I hit my thirties, I like my alcohol tolerance has like gone out the window. So it's, <laughs> if I'm going to drink anything before like 8 PM, it's got to be light and, or I'm going to be like in bed. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And, uh, I, I have a friend who's super into wine and, uh, he, one time he told me, uh, like when you're getting super into wine, you like, you know, you always start it pinot noir or whatever and then you get into the super fancy stuff but you always end up back at pinot noir and it's just, it's the same as beer uh it's like you know you start drinking light lagers in college and then you go through like the super resin ipas the belgians the dark beers the like barrel aged whatever and then you end up back at light lager <laughs> yeah 
or ESBs. Yeah. Those oh, are love any definitely one of my favorite styles that you never really see. Like Fuller's ESB is one of my favorite beers. It's just so impossible to find fresh. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm so fortunate that like, this is like the only brewish British brewery, I think in LA uh, mm-hmm. or the surrounding areas. And I, they're 10 minutes away from me and I'm so fortunate. Um, it's just, I mean, everyone in LA is still doing the like super heavy IPAs and hazies and whatever. So like finding a place that makes really good lagers is just amazing. There's a really good place in Glendale too, that makes really good lagers called brew yard. Mm. Um, so those are like my two LA breweries I'm super into. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like geeky in, in another way, right? Yeah, um, it's it's totally. <laughs> do you make a lot of lagers at home? Um, I, you know, I've been doing uh like pseudo lagers, so like um pressurized whatever. But um my, you know, I do all my pale ales under pressure to the degree that they kind of come out pretty lagery. And they're super low IBUs. Um, so I just, what I've been doing lately just to keep a good stock of like nice pool beers is uh, I have this like base pale ale recipe that I've, I've made a few beers on the YouTube with it. And then I just do one hop and, you know, we're just trying all the hops that I've got in my freezer may as well. Um, so we did like HBC uh 472 which is super melony um literally tastes like eating a cantaloupe when you drink Mm. the beer it was crazy especially for such a low hopped beer um it just played really well together and then i actually did uh one of the same recipe but i added coconut lime and i did a hbc 431 which is supposed to be super coconutty um and i'm just using what yeast? Uh, I used Kvike for all this actually, mm-hmm. and it's working out great. And um, those had no temperature control, only pressurization, and it was like ninety degrees in the garage. Wow! And they're coming out like loggers. It's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean that that's pretty awesome that you're using you know a, a trendy type of yeast, like something that's obviously been around for a long time, but we're learning how to use it a little bit more. Um, and then also pressurizing it. It's just like the, it's two processes that even five years ago, that would have been unheard of, right? Fermenting a, a, a pale ale with an ale strain at 90 degrees uncontrolled with pressure. It's It sounds like it would never work. Yeah. <laughs> it works fantastic. It's like foolproof. And what is your, so what does your fermentation profile look like um, for let's say temperature controlled pressurized ale versus an untemperature control. I think just letting it sit ambient, throwing pressure on it and then crashing it or kegging it as it is. Um, I don't crash anything. Okay. <laughs> they crash in the keg, I feel. I have floating dip tubes in everything. Mm-hmm. So I don't even worry about it. Um, but uh, what I've been doing for pressurizing, it's, I pretty much just, unless I'm using my brew built one, that's so easy to temperature control that I just set it at 75 and let it go. Um, but I've just been throwing everything in and I do, when my spunding valve was having some issues, I was pre-pressurizing it, but for the most part, I just let it pressurize itself, let it sit at 15 for like, it's usually a week. If I, if I let it, like sit for a little longer it'll only be like a week and a half just because I get busy but these things are done in a week easy um yeah and then I just you know uh close transfer it right into the keg with the pressure that's already in there I do attach this is a good tip actually I attach co2 to um the fermentation vessel um just so that it doesn't kick up a bunch of yeast when the pressure drops um, cause I have noticed like when I've done it without, um, additional pressure, it'll just kind of like become murky and it mm. like mix it all together. Um, and then the, there's like, I have no hard and fast rules for pressurized fermentation. It's I'm just trying new stuff every time at this point, um, for my non-pressurized fermentation, I will always leave it at like 65 for an ale. 
Um, Loggers, honestly, I probably won't do non-pressurized anymore just because they take so long. I'm mm -hmm. so impatient with all these beers. Um, so yeah, with 65, you can get a pretty clean character. I, if anything hits like 70, I probably won't like it. It, it'll just be too estery, too phenolic and not my vibe. I'm very into clean beers. <laughs> yeah are you making yeast starters for everything or do you just generally pitch whatever is yeah um well for the most part i will um i am actually working on a video right now about harvesting yeast and um i actually just got myself a lot of yeast supplies i got slats for all my um for all my samples um to pull and i got a whole new yeast fridge and there's a lot of awesome stuff. I actually ordered myself a microscope too in the slides. That's basically. what I was going to ask. Yeah. I'm getting really into it. And I've, I've been wanting it for a long time. I'm a total science nerd. Like, I don't know how I didn't just end up with a microscope, honestly. Mm -hmm. So um, this week, I think I'll, I'll have a microscope. I'll be able to do some cool uh, yeast cell counting. Yeah. Did you buy, um, buy some stain as well? Oh, I didn't get stain. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I, yeah. I got, I ordered that, um, the yeast book too. Um, but it's like, it's coming like after everything. So I'm like, oh, I got to get this video done. So I'm just like starting from basics and then I'll get crazy. Yeah. I will say, you know, our, our channel's most popular video is self counting. <laughs> so I'm, it's, a, I'm, it's fascinating. You know, yeah. it's like being able to be back in like a biology lab. Um, and like, you know, none of us have access to that. I, I always loved like science class. My mom's a science teacher. So, and my dad's an engineer. So it's like, I kind of grew up like doing all the fun experimenty stuff. Um, so it just mm. it's, like plays right into what I love. Yeah. I mean, that, that is brewing when it comes to harvesting at home. Um, I think people see a lot of success for not the reason that they always understand. So, you know, most yeast is fairly difficult to store on the homebrew scale, meaning that uh, a professional brewery, you're brewing a lot, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and you're harvesting that yeast at a large quantity. You're able to take, you know, calculate, you know, actually cell count and see what the concentration of the slurry is. So you know how much you're going to pitch, right. Or, or how yeah. healthy it is, if it's alive or not and make that decision. Am I pitching it or not? Whereas on a homebrew scale, a lot of times I hear people, well, it's been sitting in my fridge for six months and, you know, it's, it always works and, and being able to quantify, I think it worked or it didn't work, um, can be a little subjective and you know, what helps is a lot of times people make a, a starter, um, their homebrewers aren't as worried about cleanliness as the professional side is, uh, sanitation is obviously really important all around, but mm -hmm. as you were mentioning, like, you know, your household can go through a keg of beer within a week. So if there's any contaminants in there, you're probably not giving it time to, to alter the yeah. flavor. Right. Uh, exactly. and then, yeah. And when you're, when people are pitching yeast, it's, um, you know, they're making a starter and they're generally over pitching or they're harvesting the whole amount and then, you know, racking onto a cake or whatever. And there could very well be a lot of dead yeast there, but, um, there's just so much of it that it, it mm -hmm. tends to still ferment and not be as much of a problem. So, it's awesome that you're, you're getting a microscope because I think you'll be overly cautious now and trying to understand what the, the physiological state of that yeast is. Yeah. And, um, I, I'm one of the people who are like, Oh, it, it works out every time. I, uh, I made a starter from, uh, this wheat yeast that it was from 2019. I actually wrote mm -hmm. on the thing. It, it worked, but we're going to see, uh, <laughs> it's, it's definitely, I, I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to take off at all. Like, yeah. and I didn't have very much of it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think yeast is, um, it's like intimidating for a lot of people, especially like if you, if you haven't baked before or whatnot, mm -hmm. um, uh, people always ask me like, how to harvest yeast like and I always find it like really easy and always considered it really simple um 
but a lot of people are afraid to do it. And I understand like it's, it is the cleanliness and whatnot. And like the, the higher end equipment you get, obviously it, they're meant to make it a lot easier, but yeah, mason jars and just like swirling around, emptying into a jar and like decanting it a bit. That's been my mm -hmm. go-to for years. And yes, granted, we go through beer very quickly. <laughs> Um, and there's definitely been beers that I've said to my husband, you, you need to drink this one fast. Uh, it might be weird in like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Being able to have that control, I think is great. You know, on the, the, the brewery side, it's, you know, it, anytime you see breweries that go from serving over the bar to, you know, last year we saw a lot of breweries start to package and mm -hmm. there's a lot of issues that come with that. Um, you know, we started doing a couple canning runs here. We did mix four packs with the same, same wort with different yeast strains, which is a lot of fun, but it's difficult. You know, it, it just shows that it's hard to do well. It's, you know, if, again, if you have any contamination, which we've seen in some of our beers over the years, we've just been able to flag it and say, okay, there's this microbe living in it, you know, say lactobacillus mm -hmm. or something, but we don't taste it. Let's keep serving it until or if we end up tasting it, we know it's there because the lab told us, but when you start canning or bottling or stuff sits around, I, I've seen that with a lot of homebrew where it tastes fine when you drink it, but you always forget those four bottles in the back of the closet or fridge. Right. And it's like, you say, well, I didn't really like that batch, but then six months, a year later, you're bored and like, let me clear it out and just taste it anyways. And it's over carbonated or, you know, dried out too much. It's kind of funky. Um in my move, I found like so many beers and there was this rye pale ale that I made with my neighbor and I canned a bunch of it. And, um, of course I just left all this beer in my garage when it was like 120 degrees outside and <laughs> come in one day. And for some reason, only the rye pale ale exploded. I also had like a Berliner Weiss um this like saison in there or whatever for what the rye had something in it <laughs> and it was like well this is why you sanitize you can tell which one was better <laughs> yeah um you you keep mentioning canning at home are you just using like an october canner or what are you doing i have do the cannular pro um it's been working great i think i you're not supposed to need to adjust it a ton, but I definitely needed to. I ha had a canning run where I lost a lot of pressure. So I'm still like working it out, but it's like, of course you notice like halfway through that like you're leaking pressure from some of the cans and you're like, cool, well, I already did all of these. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, now I have to drink them instead of giving them away. Yeah, are you, what, like, tell me a little bit more about that. Are you kegging it and then just canning like a couple when the keg's almost kicked? Are you doing the whole batch? Um, basically what I've started doing is, I mean, I always carbonate in the keg. It just makes it easier. And then I'll can when I'm ready to put new beer in the kegerator. <laughs> so I just try to keep a constant, um, push of like, as soon as the beer's done, it gets carbonated, goes into the kegerator. And then the old batch gets canned and shared. Um, that's pretty much, I feel like what's gonna go on. I just, oh, I don't have any in here. I just got myself um, some can labels that are just like blank and have like the mm -hmm. style thing. But uh, yeah, I'm super excited. It's gonna be fun to share them uh, without just like chicken scratch um, Sharpie that no one can read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we recently had about like 400 crawlers come in that were unlabeled just due to some of the shipping shortages that everybody's experiencing. And so we hand labeled them all. And admittedly, it took us about 30 minutes into it before we found out the, the easier way to, way to hand label crawlers and not get them all wrinkly and just use the table instead. So that was. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I am. Um... Before I started working in the art world, I like managed this juice shop and we had to hand label all our bottles. I got so good at it. Granted, it's been like almost 10 years since I've done it, but yeah, it's a skill man. you don't lose. Yeah. Um, 
going back to like some of your cellar setup and how you serve beers, like what does, what does your keg rater look like? How many taps do you have? Um, are you ever using it strictly for fermentation? I know the setup I have at home, that's not ideal just because I don't have that much space. My garage is, um, I've got a keyser that I'll ferment in, you know, put a Johnson controller or whatever on it. And then when it's ready, I'll crash it, I'll keg it, but I can't really, to your point, I, I can't really ferment another beer until I've kicked that keg. Yeah, I mean, that's the the rock on the hard place of like using your kegerator as a um, keyser kind of deal. Um, the only time I've ever really fermented in it is when I didn't have anything going on and I was trying to make a lager because I had no other way to keep it that cold. Um, it's a pain in the ass though, especially when you're making a lager because it's like, you got to wait, what, like four weeks at least before you can like serve it. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I've just got like a Keg King two tap. Um, it has served me well. I do consider putting on a third tap because it does fit three um, kegs in it. But I've also started now that I'm doing the 10 gallon system, I'll like put one of the beer, like one five gallon keg on tap and then can the other five gallon um, keg. So that kind of keeps everything moving but yeah it's I always try to keep two beers on tap at all times um I only have one on right now of course as I say that <laughs> yeah it's been it's been uh useful and I was like one of the first things we bought um once I started home brewing and mm -hmm. I got my whole all my kegs from a friend who just stopped home brewing and uh yeah. So I, I've been kegging for so long. It's, it's nuts. I think probably within the first year of me starting homebrewing. Yeah. I, I found it was one of those things that actually increased quality quite a bit, which seems really silly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you think it's all about hot side or your fermentation, but like, well, you know, minimizing oxidation through one transfer and through having a CO2 tank available to purge things mm -hmm. and then being able to let it crash in there as opposed to a bunch of individual bottles. I just found beer cleared up and came out a lot cleaner. Yeah. And what I like about it too, is that, you know, I'm so nervous about bottling anything because like, what if you give someone like the one bottle that got contaminated it's like, at least if your keg is contaminated, like you can taste it and like notice it for the most part. And um, I don't, I, I don't feel like I've had nearly as many like weird um, infection stuff with cans either. Um, I mean, I think when you're, instead of like bottle conditioning, like actually conditioning in the keg and then filling it just, increases quality in general well a you don't have the yeast at the bottom which i absolutely hate it's like mm -hmm. a big pet peeve of mine <laughs> um and uh yeah i i i think the cans are just easier for some reason i don't know yeah. just, i love the canner <laughs> yeah that makes sense uh i know for my my kegerator keys are like it's it, it's pretty affordable to build them if you catch the freezer in the right time. I, I was really looking for used freezers for a long time. And over the years, I've had a couple that I've built from used ones and the compressor goes out and then I go a year yeah. without it and then it get the itch and build another one. Uh, but I think I got a seven cubic foot from Walmart for like 120 bucks. And then that's just, really good. Yeah. And just uh, then it's, lumber is not cheap right now. And then obviously like, yeah. you know, the faucets and couplers and CO2 and stuff adds up. But I think that stuff you can almost find used a little bit easier than, than a chest freezer sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I, there's so many people who like got into home brewing and then just like don't have time for it because they have family now or whatever that like you can find so much used stuff. Just like within my friend group, like I've had two people who uh, stopped home brewing or like disassembled their keg set up. And then I have another friend who was just like, was like one of my husband's friends and all, got the bug to like homebrew. He's got my old canner at his place. One of my SS uh, fermenters, <laughs> but he just had a kid. So he hasn't been brewing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a widespread hobby. It's like kind of crazy. 
Yeah. And so like, building a Keezer is a very common and affordable way of doing it. But um, like, tell me about some of your other fermenters in a little more detail. You said you have a 10 gallon that, um, like, is it, is it an actual conical fermenter? Is it standalone? Do you have to um, like chill it ambient with ambient temperatures? How do you control that? What does that look like? The, the brew built 14, well, I've got so many at this point. Um, I think you're talking about like the, the pressurized one, the plastic. Yeah, yeah. which whichever one, all of them. <laughs> all you right. have a lot, yeah. <laughs> I have so many. So um, my new favorite is the brew built 14 gallon. It's like the Uni X Pro, I think is what it's called. But that one's got the heating and cooling built in. Um, and it's like kind of jacketed by foam and a neoprene but it's conical it's got um butterfly valve at the bottom and this like trub catcher plastic thing mm -hmm. um yeah it's got it's like intense it's got this whole like control panel i think the control panel is like larger than my claw hammer kettle control panel actually um but it's great it works off like 120 volt power so it's fantastic it can cool um from ambient down to 30 degrees below ambient Fahrenheit, um, which like in the, that's why I started doing pressure rise um, fermenting in that one, because if the garage is getting to 110 degrees, that technically means that that should only get down to 80 degrees without mm -hmm. like constantly running. So um, I got um, a pressure release valve for it and it's got um, like ball valves on it. Um, so it's, it's like, really awesome <laughs> yeah and like um it. yeah i have two um plastic pressure um okay fermenters from keg king in australia they're the same guys who make my kegerator actually um i really like their stuff it's like super high quality um and they're like i don't know what kind of plastic they are but they're rated to like 20 no 30 I think 22 PSI is as high as you should take it. Um, but they don't have any cooling or anything. So I just kind of like, they are, they're easy to move. So I put them in my laundry room, honestly. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, other things that I have for um, temperature controlling fermentation, I have a Delta that actually has a um, glycol coil in it. So I have a... Uh, craft a brew makes a glycol chiller called the stasis and it has the ability to chill two um, ferment fermentations at once so one line has like this jacket on it um, that I can put on any fermenter um, it's just like runs the glycol like around the fermenter and then the delta it actually has a coil inside and um, I actually have Craft Brew makes their own fermenter as well that has a coil inside called a Catalyst. And that was my first um, fermenter ever. I bought their starter kit like in what, 2015, 2014? So it wasn't a, a bucket or a glass carboy? No. Well, it was a gift for my husband. So I was like, I'm going to like get it. Oh, what a. He didn't take, he didn't <laughs> that take, turned so. out. So I bought myself him. a gift. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, dealing with all of those different fermenters, like, especially the larger volume one, like, how do you, how do you clean and sanitize between the different shapes and probably different fittings even? Yeah. Um, it's the 14 gallons heavy and it's mm -hmm. not on casters yet. It's living on a furniture dolly. So what sucks is like it would be relatively easy to just pull it out of the garage and like I, I pull it out of the garage I hose it off I do um pbw with boiling water in it and just kind of like scrub it and then mm -hmm. star sand and like you know take butterfly valves off or take the um tri clamps off that just left my brain um and like clean all the fittings and stuff. Um, you know, that one, I'm like, I don't take off the neoprene. I don't take off the insulation on it to clean the outside. Mm -hmm. And it's like the 
cooling itself is like built into it. So I'm like, you kind of got to be careful to like not, it's, it's got electrical components. So you don't want to like soak it or anything. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just like, now that I have a backyard, it's relatively easy to clean, but there are like, there's like four feet of steps, like up to my garage and then down in my garage mm -hmm. for some reason. So it's like, I have to like actually lift it above these steps. And I'm like, it's almost too heavy and awkward. It, it needs some handles, I think. Yeah, um, that means it is too heavy and awkward and you just do it. If you're saying it's almost, yeah, you, just, it is, <laughs> you do it and you feel and like you probably shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The, the, with my uh, garage brewery, the, the, the biggest thing I want to invest in is a, a sink, just like a utility sink because it's, it's, like I don't have any, you know, my neighbors are really close. And so when I'm like lugging five gallons of water at a time to dump in the bushes, everybody comes out and starts looking at me. Why is there so much foam floating I down the, the communal gutter? And I'm like, sorry. <laughs> but uh, it's better yeah. than my wife yelling at me for lugging it inside and dumping it down the sink. A hundred percent. It's like a double-edged sword. It's like, you're going to get in trouble no matter what you do. Um, I like, we have this side yard that's just like nothing. Um, and I set up a table, but my hose almost doesn't reach there. And it's like at the end, like opposite end of the garage. So I got to lug everything over there. But that's how I clean like my, um, screen for my malt. Mm -hmm. Just cause like, I don't want grain everywhere. My, my backyard's like concrete. So it's, it's just going to stay there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hopefully um, birds will eat it. Yeah, a sink is definitely on our list as well. Um, and uh, just like, it's, we want like a trough kind of thing, some, just something that'll drain. Cause like, mm -hmm. I don't have anywhere, like I have a garden, but I'm like, I don't want to put like PBW in my garden. Cause like, yeah, it's, it's food safe, whatever, but the salt content can ruin your soil. Mm -hmm. just like I've done so much research, like what chemicals are not bad for your garden? It's like, everything's bad. <laughs> everything's bad. <laughs> yeah. uh yeah i mean la lastly talking about those fermenters have you found a best shape for them right we're talking about like a bucket compared to carboids to these conicals that you're working with has that made clarifying your beer pulling the trube and yeast off to you know help with conditioning a lot easier for you have you found benefit for that have you seen a difference between the volume and shape of specific pieces of equipment um, it's definitely, I feel like with the conicals, the, the yeast and true become way more compacted. Um, so it does like, you can kind of shake it around on accident without completely having to like crash it again or let it sit. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think just having the conicals that have valves or like a lot of pressure ones do the floating dip tubes to pull. Um, I think having valves that rest right above your true blind and the floating dip tubes just make it so much better when you're putting it in kegs, you know, and I use floating dip tubes in all my kegs. So, you know, I'm never having to like pour out the first pint because it's cloudy, um, mm -hmm. and tastes like a mouthful of yeast. Um, so, I mean, the floating dip tubes. When I found out those existed, I became so obsessed. I, I think I own probably 15 at this point. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love a clean beer, like a clear beer. Mm -hmm. um, so that was like one of the things like for a while we were talking about like, oh, we can't get like a good clear beer. Maybe we should be filtering. Like, what should we do? And I did a bunch of research on that and then like stumbled upon floating dip tubes. And I was like, Duh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes all. Are you using any other findings or anything hot side to help? I just throw in worth a lot, but other than that, yeah, everything comes out relatively. I mean, you know, there's usually a slight haze in the, uh, my beers, but I serve them so young that mm -hmm. it's, they just don't have time to drop out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so thanks for hanging out today and yeah. catching up it was great to see you and geek out over some of your setup because i know you're always <laughs> always going for it and learning new new techniques but where can everybody find you um you can find me on youtube at flora brewing on instagram flora underscore brewing um i've got a website floorbrewing.com that 
doesn't have a ton on it. Um, mm-hmm. We do have a podcast called Brewing After Hours. Um, it is now ended, but the backlogged episodes are there. So I, I didn't tell you this, but we're uh, ending the podcast because now right. I have a dog to take care of. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a lot of work, but uh, it's so much obviously work. thanks for having me on it. And I thought the yeah. other guests were awesome. Yeah, it was great while it lasted. Maybe uh, in the future, we'll start it back up again. But uh, for the meantime, we're taking a hiatus. <laughs> yeah, totally makes sense. Um, and then anybody interested in what's coming up? Uh, we are in October. The webcast we're doing is uh, another spotlight on specific beer styles. We're doing all things smoked beer with Jen Blair of Orpheus Brewing, which is pretty rad. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jen, but she's done a lot with beer education um, based out in Georgia and works with the AHA and um, just did a presentation on smoked beer a couple months ago. So it's something I'm equally as passionate about. I actually just went to Orpheus when I was in Atlanta. Oh, awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. Their their beer is ridiculously fantastic. Yeah, that's that's great. I haven't had the opportunity to try it, but maybe she'll send me some prior to the, the webcast. I think it's uh, Lyrical was my favorite. So try to get some of that. It's so yeah. good. <laughs> good to know. Um, yeah. Again, great seeing you. And thanks for you taking too. some time this morning to, to chat with everybody. And uh, this will live on our YouTube page uh, within the next, hopefully this afternoon, but maybe tomorrow at the latest. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was a blast to catch up. Likewise. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye.